So we're gonna jump right in and get started. So welcome everyone. Thank you for popping in the chat and introducing yourself and where you're tuning in from. We are gonna start the show for Panama Live, Uncovering the Lives of Tropical Feeder Birds. My name is Rachel Mady, and I am the project leader for Bird Cams Lab. And I'll let Renee introduce herself as well, my co-host. Hi folks, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Renee Machowski, and I'm the BirdCams Communication Assistant. And hello, everyone. I am Ben Walters. I'm the BirdCams Communication Specialist. Um, Rachel and Renee will be, you know, heading the, the show today. I'll just be hanging out in the chat and uh, talking with you there today. Thanks, Renee. Thanks, Ben. So, like Ben mentioned, that we have the chat feature. We want you to be able to use that to talk to us, whether you want to participate in discussion or if you have any technical problems, like you can't hear us or you can't see the video for some reason. And we also have a Q&A function as well um, because this is a webinar. So if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. You can click there and ask a question if you'd like myself or Renee to answer that during this about the birds or about the data, whichever you like. Um, any other questions in terms of more back and forth can go in the chat, but the Q&A is there. If you have a question you want us to answer, definitely during the session. And for those of you who haven't introduced yourself yet, please go into the chat, warm up your fingers, and let us know who you are, um, why you're here today, and where you're tuning in from. Some people have already gone in there, a lot of people actually, and we're seeing that people are tuning in from all over the world, which is pretty cool. I myself am tuning in from Baltimore, Maryland. Looks like we have some more people tuning in from Texas, Colorado, New York. We have a lot of people tuning in from areas of where the fires are currently going on right now. Our thoughts are with you all. We got some people from Virginia, from Panama. Welcome, so glad to have you. From Michigan. Someone has a property down, it, down near the feeder, so that's cool. Wow, we have everyone from every which way, which is really exciting. Something else I want to launch and test out with you all is a poll. So we're trying to make this as two-way street as possible. And so we're gonna be using polls to try to get a sense of who you all are. So I'm gonna launch this poll right now. You should see it pop up on your screen. You can go ahead and click to answer. How long have you been watching the Panama Fruit Feeder Cam? From you've never watched it before to you are watching that cam multiple times a day. Looks like we have almost 100 people tuning in, which is great. So I'll give it a couple more seconds so we can get everyone's vote in. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end it there. It's okay if you didn't get a chance to answer. Thank you to everyone who did. And it looks like we have basically everyone across the board. So we have a lot of people here who have never watched. Welcome. We're excited to talk to you more about our one of our favorite cams. And then we also have people who have watched it a couple times, maybe once or multiple times a day or daily. So welcome everyone. It's so great to be here. All right, so I am gonna charge on forward and we're gonna get into it. And I want to orient you where we're going while we're here today in the webinar. We're gonna start off first by getting us all on the same page about what BirdCamps Lab is and what Panama Live is within the realm of BirdCamps Lab. I'm then gonna, gonna turn it over to Renee so we can talk about the six species that we studied and learn a little bit more about their natural history and watch some cool clips from our favorite cam. And then we're gonna talk about how we collected the data that we did and then the new insights that we've learned about these species from the data that we collected. And then open the floor up to answer your questions, to have a bit of a more back and forth discussion with you all to hear what you wanna know or what insights you also have about these birds and about what the data are telling us. So with that, I'll just start off by talking about BirdCams Lab. So right now you're seeing a screenshot of our website, BirdCams Lab. And this website was created because here at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, we were watching the viewers watch the birds on cam and ask questions and collect their own data. So we were inspired by them to create an online space that we now have where those CAM viewers and scientists can come together to create investigations 
and answer the questions that they're interested in. And it allows people like you who are tuning in today to jump into the scientific process any part of the way. So you can observe and ask questions. You can also collect data. You can analyze that data and explore it and then share out the findings with the rest of the community. So it's a pretty, pretty fun process. And to date, we've done two investigations, Hawk Talk and Battling Birds, and then Panama Live is the third. So right here, you're seeing a screenshot from the Panama Fruit Feeder Cam. And this is the cam where Panama Live was focused on. So Panama Live is the third investigation of the Bird Cams Lab project. And it's featuring the Panama Fruit Feeder Cam, which itself features a feeding table that's located at the Canopy Lodge in Panama. And the viewers watching this and the scientists wanted to learn more about what these birds were doing on this cam. And so they got together, spent weeks discussing what we should investigate and came up with three questions to focus on. One, when do focal species arrive at the feeder? Two, how does this vary from day to day? And three, does the timing of food affect when birds arrive? And it's time for our second poll. So coming up with these questions was a really fun process and really, really cool to involve both viewers and the scientists. And we wanna know of those of you listening today, how many of you were a part of that process? Did you brainstorm and design the questions that were investigated? You can answer yes, no, I don't know, or I wish I could have. I'll go ahead. We have 110 people um, tuning in. That's so exciting. So I'll let a couple more people throw in their votes. All right. Thank you to everyone who voted. It's okay if you didn't have time to click. I'll share these results back out. So it looks like we had a couple people, about seven of you, did help us come up with these questions, thank you. And then we have a lot of people who didn't. So we are so glad you could be a part of the process today. Cause like I said, Burkham's lab is all about bringing you in and out of the whole process at any step of the way. So we're excited to have everyone here. And there's a lot of you who wishes that you can. So don't worry, you can stay tuned and help us with more investigations in the future. Okay, so with that, I'll stop sharing the results. And, I will turn it over to Renee. So I'll stop sharing my screen and let her take over. All right, uh, hello again, everyone. I'm Renee Machowski. Um, let's have a look at some of the Panama fruit feeder cam footage for our six uh, focal species and review just some basic natural history for each of them. Okay, and Ben's gonna play us a clip here. Here it is. All right, uh, Rufus motmot. Rufus motmots are vibrantly colored birds of wet forests from Honduras south into Bolivia. And if you spot one, they will most likely be sitting motionless in trees, solo or in pairs. They are so motionless, in fact, that I sometimes think the cam is frozen when they are visiting. Their diets are rather diverse. They eat crabs, lizards, insects, and as we've seen, various types of fruit. They are considered low energy specialists. They select perches on shaded branches from which they dart out to eat insects. Like many birds in the Neotropics, they have been documented following army ants. And as we've observed, they will also visit and take fruit from feeders. Great cowled wood rail. The gray cowled wood rail is uh, pretty conspicuous even when they aren't spreading their beautiful wings on the feeder to sun themselves. Not only are they one of our largest cam visitors, they're rather, rather brightly colored. Especially those day glow red legs and that bright yellow bill with the seafoam green tip. That's my favorite part. Um, here we see one sunning itself and this behavior is thought to aid in feather mite control. This chicken-like rail thrives in damp woodlands in Central and South America. Rails are generally secretive, though these are considered bolder than other rails and may be seen in the open more frequently, alone or in pairs. They're actually monogamous birds, so the pairs can be found together year round, which I think we've all noticed here. Uh, they have nicknames on the cam and they visit together. Um, their diet is rather diverse. Um, oh, we're back. We're on to the, sorry, chachalaca. I'll move on. Gray-headed chachalacas. Uh, these are large and somewhat clumsy brown birds with gray heads, long legs, and long broad tails. 
These can be found from Honduras south into Colombia, and they are seldom seen on the ground and often seen in groups of six to 12. It's not uncommon at certain times of the year for them to take over the feeder entirely um, and arrive sort of whenever fresh food is put out um, and scare the other birds away, but I happen to love them. Um, uh, and here we see two adults with one of their young. Clay-colored thrushes. Clay-colored thrushes are an all-over brown thrush with a yellow bill. The range is expanding and it currently includes South Texas into Northern Colombia. They are widespread and common throughout their range and they thrive in many types of habitat, habitats, including shrubby woods, parks, and yards. Much like other members of the thrush family, their diet consists mainly of worms, insects, and fruits. It surprises some people to learn that this is actually the national bird of Costa Rica. Costa Rica, after all, has very many colorful birds from which to choose. Why then did they choose the small brown thrush? Well, it has a very lovely melodic song um, and actually lives regularly in close proximity to humans. So I think we've just grown a fondness for them um, despite their somewhat plain appearance. Uh, crimson back tanager. This brilliant red and black tanager can be found in somewhat limited range in Panama, Colombia, and Venezuela, typically in lowlands and foothills below 1300 meters. Most often they are found in small flocks in forested or shrubby habitats, and females can be told from the males by their overall duller feathers. And males also have a bright white uh, lower mandible, and you can see that here. Um, these tanagers like most eat mainly fruit, but they'll supplement with seeds and insects. Crimson back tanagers are a feeder cam favorite due to their rich red coloration. And that coloration has earned them a nickname in Panama, Sangra del Toro, which means blood of the bull. Quite poetic. Thick-billed euphonias. Uh, Thick-billed euphonia males can easily be told from their female partners, as you can see here, the males being the ones cloaked in that lovely sapphire blue, though the females can be hard to separate from other euphonia species. They range from Panama into South America, as far south as Bolivia, and parts of Brazil, where they prefer open forests, edge habitats, gardens. Uh, they will often be seen in mixed flocks with tanagers and warblers, and they eat mainly fruits and seeds, uh, pretty standard diet. And fun fact, I've actually seen them um, nesting in plants uh, that are hung around the lodge. So that's kind of cool. They will also nest in close proximity to humans. Um, and I'd like to mention that although I just shared a lot of information here about our focal species, that comparatively little is actually known about many of them, which makes citizen science research like BirdCam's lab that much more valuable. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Rachel. Thanks, Renee. That was awesome. I love, I've seen those clips before, but I love just watching those birds um, do their thing on the cam. It's really, really cool and a unique opportunity I always get reminded of and excited by. So I'm going to reshare my screen. And we're going to launch right into another poll. Um, some of you may be really familiar with the birds that Renee just talked to us about. Some of you may be less familiar, but now you know a little bit more. And I am curious to know which are your favorite species. So we have six species we just featured today and that we studied the clay colored thrush, the crimson back tanager, gray cowed wood rail, gray headed chakalaka, rufus mot, -mot and the thick billed euphonia. So go in and weigh in. I know I have my own personal favorite. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end it there. No worries if you didn't get a chance. It looks like we do have a winner. Looks like the Rufus Mott Mott is the all-time favorite, though all of them did get some love. Um, I do have to say the Rufus Mott Mott is a really striking bird and I am with you there on that one. I do really love that bird. Okay, so we have these six species. And we wanted to know more about them and we talked about what research questions we had. So how did we actually study them? Well, we set out to know more about these species and we wanted to do it in real time. So we wanted to watch the cam and be able to click and log what we were seeing. And so we developed this really cool tool that would allow us to click a button for each of the six species and then we could click a button as well 
whenever we saw fruit being added because we thought that would potentially affect the arrival of the birds at the feeder. And some of you listening today may have helped us collect the data and I am going to launch another poll. Surprise, surprise, because we are curious to see how many of you out there helped us collect data. So you'll see that poll pop up on your screen. Did you collect data for the Panama Live investigation? Yes, no, I'm not sure, or I wish I could have. It has been a while since we've collected data. We collected data back in February of this year, so it has been a while. So it's okay if you're not sure. All right, with that, I'll end polling. It looks like we had a lot of people who didn't help collect data and a lot of people who wish that they could. But I do wanna say thank you to everyone that did help collect data. Thank you for making this possible and for us to understand more about these species, but we are glad to have everyone here today. But because there's a lot of you out there who weren't a part of this data collection process, I do wanna get us all on the same page. So I'm going to stop sharing that screen and share a short video that um, gives you a small window into what it looks like to collect data. So, there we go. You should be seeing the video now. And I'm gonna click play and kind of walk you through what we did. Once I put this back to the beginning, there we go. Okay, so this is a tutorial that we put out for participants when they were helping us to collect data. And it shows you how it happens. So we see some clay color thrushes on the feeder. And when they arrive, we're able to click a button and this shows up in this session you reported down below. And we have six buttons, so we were studying six species. And so that meant other species that showed up on the cam, we weren't going to actually click. We were gonna enjoy them as they pass by, but we were gonna focus on these six. And we focus on the six because the community voted to. And we also wanted to click whenever we see fruit being added. It's already added, so we don't need to click it here, but we can if we need to. We can remove mistakes if we ever have mistakes and click if there's a great tail wood rail. At the end of each session, we would click end data collection. And that's just about it. That's how you collect data. So it's something that was really fun and really um, easy to do, just kind of an added activity to do as you're watching the cam. And so, go to the next screen. In the end, we had over 60 people help us collect data and they made over 11,000 observations, which gave us a mountain of data to work with, which was really, really exciting. And just so you know, they did this over two weeks back in February. So this wasn't even over a long time period either. We took the data collected by everyone in the community and then we turned it into visualization so that we could all explore the data together. Again, in that scientific process I laid out, we want everyone to be able to jump in and out whenever they feel like they want to. So we wanted to make it available so that not just the scientists, but everyone else could explore the data together. And so with that, I'm going to switch my screen again because I wanna show you some of the really cool findings that we found. So bear with me. Okay. All right, so you should see a screen right now with um, a title that says, when do less common species arrive at the feeder? So this is one of the many graphs we created with the data collected by participants. And this less common species is referring to the three out of the six that were less common. We wanted to divvy it into a more common and a less common graph. So we have um, not too much information all at once to try to get a handle of the patterns we were seeing. And you can see here under the choose what to display that there are three species that can show up on this graph. And what we're gonna see here is along the horizontal axis, we have half hour time intervals. So from 6.30 to 7, 7 to 7.30, 7.30 to 8. And we needed to do that because, and split time into intervals because we wanted to calculate for each of those intervals the percent chance that a species would arrive. And so that is what you're seeing on the y-axis. I'm gonna click on one of these species so we can see what that actually looks like. So for the Rufus Motmot, this first bar is saying that there is an 80% chance that the Rufus Motmot over that two week period would show up between 6.30 and seven. And so we calculated that number by taking 
the number of times between 6.30 and 7 o'clock that someone clicked that there was a Rufus Mott Mott. And then we took the total number of times we had that 6.30 to 7 o'clock interval that people were watching, and we took those two numbers, divided it, and multiplied it by 100 to give us that percentage. And so what's really cool with this data is that it matches what we've been hearing from participants, is that the Rufus Mott Mutt tends to show up in the morning and in the evening, but the chance that it's gonna be there in the midday is much lower. So it's pretty cool that we saw the data reflect some of the anecdotes we were hearing from people watching the cam. I'll go ahead and click on one more species to compare. And the gray cow wood rail shows a really similar pattern, this kind of bimodal or double peaked pattern. And we can see here that it's the percent chance of the gray cow wood rail being at the theater is higher in the morning, higher in the evening, and lower in the afternoon. And it was really great in the forums underneath each of these graphs, which anyone after this is welcome to go into and share your thoughts as well. Um, one of the participants, Clive, pointed out that it's kind of like a midday siesta, and maybe this pattern is driven by the fact that midday it's a bit warmer. So these species really prioritize the trade-off between foraging and energy saving. So potentially they're foraging during the cooler parts of the day to save that energy and maximize their energy intake. But it's pretty cool that there's a difference between the two species. So the gray cow wood rail is a little bit more consistent in the percent chance that it's going to be there, whereas the Rufus Mott Mott goes from 80% all the way down to 10%. So pretty cool to see a pattern, but even that pattern is a little bit variable between those two species. And now before we open the floor to hear more from maybe what you're thinking when you see this, I want to go to a next graph to understand more about the gray cow wood rail. And here, what you're going to see is the percent chance of arrival again on that y axis, but now instead on the horizontal axis, we're going to see the minute interval since food was put out. And back in February, which honestly feels like ages, it keeps going like ages ago every time I say February, um, the Canopy Lodge staff at that time was stocking the feeders just about every two hours from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And through discussions with the community, we realized that the food may be affecting when the birds are arriving. So we should look into seeing how that's affecting the chance that they're gonna be there. And so what you're seeing on the horizontal axis here is the zero time is the time that the food was put out. And then you have intervals from zero to five, five to 10, 15 to 20. And we have them split into intervals like that so we can calculate that percent chance. So I'm gonna for the gray cowed wood rail, which is what this graph is for, I'm gonna turn on the morning, and the morning is referring from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. So all the times that food was put out gets combined. And so for the gray cow wood rail, for this first block, we see that there's an 8% chance that a gray cow wood rail would arrive 15 to 20 minutes after that food, the food is put out. So that means that the gray cow wood rail showed up and we counted the number of 15 to 20 minute intervals where it was actually there, divided that number by the total number of 15 to 20 minute intervals we had that we actually watched and multiplied that by 100 to give us that percent chance of arrival. And so this is what the pattern looks like in the morning. So it doesn't look like the gray cow wood rail is there right when food is there and shows up a little bit later. And maybe that increases a little bit the farther away it gets from when that food's put out. This is what it looks like midday. And midday we define here is between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. And doesn't look like there's much of a pattern, but definitely is later. It's not going to be there right when the food is put out. And evening, we see this pattern. And evening here is defined as 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. And we see here that the percent chance that a wood rail is there is zero until we get to about 30 to 35 minutes uh, um, from the time that food's put out. And then it tends to increase. So that's really interesting. And we would love to hear more from you if you have any ideas as to why that pattern is like that. I have some ideas of my own, but I would rather um, open the floor and see if there've been any questions so far, or if you'd like to put something in the chat to hear more about the birds or the data we're seeing here. Yeah, I think there's been uh, some good questions in the chat and the Q&A section. Uh, just before we move ahead with any, I just, some people have been throwing questions into into the chat panel 
Um, there's also a separate Q&A panel um, you can find on your uh, sort of the, the Zoom tools. Um, so if you have questions, please try to submit them there so we can make sure they don't get lost in all the chat. Um, but we have one question here from Jim about this particular um, graph with the, with the rails. Does okay. the rail show up some time interval after some other species as though they use the other species as an indicator that there's food? That is a great question. Um, we, there are other graphs of the other species, so I'll share with you one other one, and then I'll let Renee um, tune in to see just in case she has any ideas of if they kind of cue in or show up with other species. But let me show you one other graph. The clay colored thrush. So this is the same graph as the gray cowwood rail in terms of the food is here as well. And when I turn on morning, I turn on midday, you see that there's not really much of a pattern and they're just kind of there all the time. And so at least for this species, they may not be um, the species that's being um, letting the gray cowwood rail cue in, or maybe they are because they are right here when the food is there. And Interestingly enough, in the evening, when the gray cow wood rail kind of has that big peak, the clay color thrush is here, but then it goes down. And one of the participants pointed out they're one of the birds that seems to leave earlier. And so maybe you're right, maybe the gray cow wood rail is queuing in and sees a bunch of clay color thrushes moving towards the feeder and then follows them. Totally possible. All right. And then um, to go along with since we're talking about rails, the question came up when, when uh, Renee was playing uh, the highlight clips and they're wondering, Anne was wondering how does spreading the wings, like the wing behavior of the rail, this is kind of not related to the graph specifically, but how does spreading wings and wood rails help with mite control? So research suggests that uh, there are a number of reasons why birds sun themselves, but related specifically to feather mites, um, some research was done with black knotty feathers uh, where they reconstructed a wing and set the wings out um, to see what temperatures they would reach after say 10 minutes in the sun. And the feathers would reach upwards of 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So the thinking is, that either, uh, so bed bugs, for instance, die at, I think, 100, no, bed bugs die at like 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and the feathers were reaching upwards of 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So the thinking is that either these mites are dying as a direct result of the heat from sun exposure, um, and or uh, they rotate their positions on the feather structure as the sun and, and UV rays hit them. And so you'll note that after sunning uh, their wings like that, birds will often preen. And so it, you know, it, it's all speculation, of course, but research suggests that the heat is actually killing them and uh, they're being preened away, dead or alive, after, after the sun exposure. That, that's great, Renee. I've also um, heard of some research that suggests that the the bugs want to, uh, or the parasites, whatever they are, want to avoid sunlight as well, and they may be crawling to other parts of the feathers, exactly. where the birds can more easily reach them and bring them away. Yep, so they're rotating their position so that the birds can access them. And Charlotte, thank you for mentioning uh, that that is 60 degrees Celsius um, for our non-US <laughs> viewers. Thank you. Okay, um, so we've got a couple other questions here about sort of how we collected the data um, in terms of you know figuring out how we ensure the accuracy of participant observations. Um, how do you control for variation in observations um, over time or mm. per time interval? Uh, Rachel, you're probably the the one to go to on those if you want to um, share your insights. Totally. Uh, I think that is a great question and one I've actually thought a lot about. So in pursuing collecting data live, uh, we realize we're also pursuing this question of, okay, well, what does the data actually mean? And so we have that end data collection button on there um, so that we 
know when people stop watching. And so the data I showed you today was from the data that was collected that has a start and a stop. So if there wasn't a stop, we didn't include it in this initial kind of exploratory phase because we wanted to be sure that someone was looking at the feeder um, and was actually recording data and didn't suddenly have something else to do, which I mean, <laughs> I, I'm guilty of myself hearing the doorbell ring and going like, oh no, need to click stop. Um, and then in terms of figuring out what's going on with multiple people watching, uh, we would bin observations that were close together. So for some of those um, graphs that you saw secondhand about time since food was put out, if, a, if someone marked, I saw a gray cow wood rail, and then within a minute, someone else also marked, I saw a gray cow wood rail, they would be combined together. Um, they may not be the best way. There is actually no best way at this point. We're kind of into unexplored territory, which is really cool. Um, and that's why we're inviting people like you to be a part of this process because we're still trying to figure this out. But there may be better ways or maybe we need to refine the way that we've done it in terms of figuring out the accuracy um, because we haven't yet done any measure in terms of our participant observations, what's actually there. We've instead kind of smushed everyone together to say this is one observation. So thank you. Awesome. And um, so we have a few more questions related to the wood rail going back to that. Um, David asked, do wood rails come at times to avoid other birds such as the chocolate, uh, chachalacas? And Calliope um, shared one of her observations from the cam. And, and I don't know, Renee, maybe you can share. R Renee is sort of our resident um, Panama cam expert. So um, maybe she can share what, what she's noticed from her observations as well. But perhaps the wood rails prefer to show up in the evening after all the main action has happened on the feeder. Um, it seems like they're always the cleanup crew at the end of the day. Would you like me to talk about that? Or <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Um, I like that thinking. They are rails, as I mentioned, are secretive and these rails less so. Um, but I do, I think many of us have noticed that um, when they visit, they tend to do a lot of, uh, people capture them often uh, making a certain look at the, the cam and they call it their, their guilty look. But how I process that is they do spend a fair bit of time stopping and listening um, for activity. And I have always thought that that looks a little bit like, you know, maybe feeling in danger or, you know, too exposed um, because that is a pretty exposed position for any bird, but especially a bird that, that is more of a skulker. Um, in terms of them trying to avoid uh, the times that chachalacas visit, I would say on the whole that that um, maybe can be said for most of our visitors. Chachalacas are uh, relatively noisy um, and certainly take up the, uh, the entire feeder whether it's three or, or 12 of them visiting. So um, yeah, I think there might be something, some merit to both of those observations. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, thanks for your insights there, Renee. Uh, so we have a couple other uh, questions. This one seems like a good one for you, Rachel. Did you do any correlation calculations for some of these observations? And was there any significant correlation between, say, time of day and visit? That is a great question. And that is something that maybe we should consider doing. At this point in the investigation, we've just, we're in the exploratory phase. So we're at that phase where scientists um, typically will come to the data set and be like, okay, what is going on? And what can I use to kind of inform my next step in the analysis? And so at this point, we're just trying to see what's going on and trying to see if there are patterns in there that we can explore with what is, and what you're talking about is more of this inferential type of statistics where you're doing an actual test. And so right now we're in the part where we're in the descriptive type phase and we're just trying to see what's going on. And then your observations, just like you made right there and other observations from participants and asks for those type of analyses is what inform the next step and what types of analysis we should do. And so that is definitely something we should consider doing is trying to really 
test for that relationship that we're seeing for some of these species. Is it actually there? And what are the chances that it's just there by random chance? What are the chances that it's actually a signal in terms of the behavior of the birds? Awesome. Um, so there's a couple questions here, one from uh, Penguin Atwell um, and one from Jim uh, Roper. And they're both sort of related to some of the other things some of the other variables that, that might be going on that could be <clears throat> having an effect on, on, this, on the graph we've been looking at and the bird's behavior at the feeder. Penguin asks, I've noticed that it rains there a lot and when it does, there's very few of any birds that come to the feeder. Are the rains usually at, regular time, or at a regular time each day? And have you looked into how these heavy rains affect the data? That is a great question. And it actually came up during when we were talking about um, what questions we wanted to ask and how we wanted to collect the data and considering weather and whether we should account somehow for rain and whether we should tie the data we collected to rain did come up and we were definitely interested in doing that. In terms of how regular the rains are down there, Renee, do you have a sense of that? Because you're more familiar with the area? Um, let's see, so the rainy season is uh, currently underway and will be tapering off um, toward, uh, I think around November and ending in December. Um, so it is the rainier time of year right now. And I would say that um, when the data were being collected, that was- That was back in month? February. Okay, so it would have been a bit drier then um, but during the rainy season, uh, it seems to be more in the late morning, you know, early afternoon that it really pours. Uh, but I'd be very interested to see how that affects, um, you know, actual visits. But yeah, when, when this research was happening, that would have been the dry season. Yeah, and so there is a possibility if there is that, if you all are interested in doing it, certainly it's worth looking into. Um, we didn't set up a way to collect data right at the feeder, but there is potentially a weather station that we could look into nearby to get some rain data to try to piece together that puzzle because we were interested in the beginning and I'm glad to hear that people are interested in, in it now. Weather can really drive variation and it's really cool. Yeah, thanks Rachel. That's a, that's a great point that while that, that may not have been a part of this particular investigation, we are always interested in um, ramping up new investigations, getting people brainstorming about what they want to um, look at in terms of, you know, on the cam, whether it's either live or archived footage. So um, a great thing to put in our back pocket and think about next time. Um, and then uh, sort of along those same lines, uh, James Roper asks, uh, they've no he's noticed at his home feeders that when birds have a better alternative to a banana, they often eat the alternative. And um, he gets the impression that birds will eat food of lesser quality just to fill up and satisfy their hunger. Um, and then they forage uh, for the preferred food. Could this um, be something that we monitor on the Panama feeder cam? Is it something that we monitored? Um, and I don't know if anybody has any anecdotes for, for what types of food were often put out during this particular investigation or what types of food were preferred over others. Yeah, definitely. If anyone helped us during this data collection or can remember back to February or have noticed birds preferring one food or the other, please go right into the chat and let us know because some of you watch the cam much, much more than I or Renee have ever done. So your insight is super valuable for this question. And it's a really good question, um, Jim, because researchers have really thought about this idea of food quality when thinking about bird feeding, not just in Panama, but across the world. And so thinking about preference for the types of food that are put on the Panama cam is definitely something we didn't look into this investigation, but maybe that's something we think about for the future. Um, and the food that gets put out are typically more like food scraps or some extras. and so. Um, it varies in terms of what gets put out, and it's very interesting to think about how that's affecting how the birds are there. So yeah, during this investigation, I would say it was 
almost 90% uh, bananas and maybe some papaya thrown in, maybe a day here and there of uh, pineapple. I can't speak to um, the bird's food preference in terms of what's offered um, in the wild, uh, but I would like to say that I see Raul out there um, in the chat and I wanna say hi and I would love everyone to say hi to Raul. Um, this is his property that the cam is on and uh, maybe we can even put him in the hot seat and, and target some questions that we struggle uh, with to him. So yes, please say hi to Raul. And Raul, feel free to, to correct us if you, uh, if you see us uh, uh, going wrong. <laughs> certainly. Uh, but yeah, certainly bananas uh, were the primary food. And um, yeah, these, these aren't uh, scraps. They're actually uh, purchased or harvested on the property. Um, the property doesn't have, uh, you know, enough of a uh, a large enough banana farm, obviously, to uh, feed from the farm itself. So a lot of the bananas are purchased. Um, but yeah. And it looks like Raul did chime in. So thank you so much. Um, he's saying that bananas and papayas are the most popular and that he has seen and cooked rice seems to attract the rails and the jays. So that's really cool. I wonder why that's happening. Okay, awesome. That's great to have that uh, insider expertise in the chat. Um, <clears throat> we had a, a another question that that you know brought up a really good point. Um, you know, thinking about all these different types of species that visit, they asked, "Are tra are Tuchalaskas predators um, of other birds?" Or I would ask, "Are are any of these other birds predators of other birds?" in in terms of do they do they eat fruit as well as prey on species so could that be a reason why maybe other birds aren't visiting when they're there so to my knowledge we don't have any bird predators any avian predators uh, of birds visiting although i will say that uh, i haven't looked into the black chested jays to see if they might predate nests and nestlings and things like that uh, but I don't believe they would, you know, and the reason I mention that is because uh, some of our, our North American jays do that. Um, but I don't believe uh, that they would go after birds at the feeder. Raul can uh, chime in and correct me on that if I'm missing anything. But I don't believe we have any bird on bird predation um, happening. Uh, but we definitely have some hierarchy. And I think people have observed that, at least anecdotally, that uh, the clay colored thrushes. Um, are pretty capable of of clearing the feeder when it's um, birds their size or smaller um, visiting and uh, yeah and we do have some birds that will take um, frogs and um, you know some larger prey items larger than insects but to my knowledge not not a bird on bird except for maybe those jays <laughs> but probably not at the feeder again yeah, I think there's definitely a few species that may uh, predate nests, like nestlings or eggs, but um, I haven't seen personally any uh, avian predators attacking other birds at the, at the feeder. And it looks like Raul chimed in and said that you're right, Renee, about the jay's behavior. And Jim also chimed in to say that um, I think it was a slaty breasted wood rail, a southern relative to the gray cowed. Um, he's seen that bird eat baby thrushes. So it looks like there's some birds out there that will go ahead and be a little bit more predatory towards other birds. All right. So, do, uh, Rachel, do you want to keep rolling with questions currently, or do you have any other graphs that you want to show at this time? Questions are great. Um, I do have other graphs if people are interested to see more of what the data could reveal. So if you're interested in seeing the data, um, let us know in the chat and say, hey, I want to see more graphs. But otherwise, I would love to keep um, answering those questions. Great. So we have a, a, a couple of questions about sort of the future of the, this current investigation, um, talking about what we're planning ahead. One from Suzanne uh, Solerio in the Q and A is asking: Will you be collecting data for a long for a longer time period 
um, in future years in order to tabulate if the species is holding its own or declining, or if I'm guessing too, if these um, trends that we're seeing are, um, you know, happening again in future years. Also, uh, Madeline Etkin is asking uh, if we can do a rainy season observation period. Um, also signing, asking how we sign up to be a data collector. Oh, I love it. I love hearing that you guys are excited about this data collection. Um, so we would love to keep collecting data and investigating more things, answering more of the questions you have. And so that's kind of the whole thing with Birdcans Lab is that we're here and creating a space for scientists to work with viewers to answer the questions that they have and to kind of build out how we do that with the CAMs. And so definitely hold on to those questions and keep asking us. And Ben at the end of this is gonna put links in the into the chat so you can make sure you're signed up for BirdCam's lab. You can sign up for the newsletter so that you are in the know about when we're doing this and how you can participate. The Panama feeder, fruit feeder cam right now we're just wrapping up this data exploration side of this current investigation that we've done. There may be one down the road soon using some archive data, but definitely we are always looking to support you all in investigating the questions that you have on this cam. And I think something during the raining season, especially in contrast to the dry season would be really cool because we know the dynamics shift a lot from season to season and month to month in terms of what birds are there and how the birds are acting on the feeder. And also thinking about this idea of long-term monitoring, we, I mean, it's incredible that we are able to see um, in total, we've seen 66 species on this cam. That's awesome, that's incredible. And so the cam might be useful in helping to make sure the species are there and estimating relative abundance potentially. So that's something we can think about moving forward in terms of the usefulness of this cam. Awesome. Um, so that just answers uh, Rob's question of how many different species besides the six visit this specific feeder. <laughs> and obviously we've got, we're up to, I think 66 now, like Rachel said, um, some of them are, some species are obviously much more common than others. Some we've just seen once or twice. Um, but Debbie is also asking, are there any anim or any mammals that visit and chase away the birds at the feeder? Um, I have both chipmunks and squirrels that visit and share seeds with the local birds at, at Debbie Feeders. And then Margaret goes on to ask, um, sort of similar to what we see here in the U.S., birds of prey visiting feeders due to the easy picking um, that, you know, since they attract birds. Uh, do any South American raptors take that opportunity at the Panama feeders? I have wondered that as well, and I have not seen that on cam. Um, but I believe I have asked Raul and maybe one of the guides if they ever see opportunities being taken around the feeders. So Raul, uh, if you're still with us, maybe you can comment about uh, if any raptors are, are watching the feeders and taking opportunities. I can say having visited there um, that I didn't notice that happening, but I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, as to the mammals, we've had, I believe, 10 mammalian species. Um, visit the cam so far. And I'm not thinking of any instances of them directly, even the squirrels, the variegated and the red-tailed squirrel who do visit during the day, and sometimes the Watson's climbing rat who visits during the day. Um, I've not seen them chase uh, birds off the feeder, and I've seen sharing, you know, where there'll be a squirrel on one side and, and a bird on the other. So the interaction doesn't seem to be too predatory um, yet, whereas, you know, if you take a North American feeder, a uh, gray squirrel shows up and, you know, kind of boom, everyone's gone. It seems to be a little different there. Um, and these squirrels' um, interactions with the birds are often comical and, and interesting. And um, I, I saw some footage uh, last week that uh, I was reminded that was terribly amusing about a squirrel or uh, an anecdote I have about a squirrel um, where a basilisk comes to the feeder and a squirrel is munching on a banana and the basilisk just takes the banana and starts eating it and the squirrel's left sitting there, you know, where's my banana? So um, these maybe aren't quite as feisty. Uh, maybe there's more food available or, or, you know, whatever the reasoning is, I shouldn't speculate, but, um, and I, I'll just real quick address this. I think somebody mentioned monkeys. 
Um, we don't, there don't seem to be monkeys right near the lodge. Uh, I think they're a little further away, not far from the lodge, but not right there at the lodge. And we do get opossums, so far no kinkajous. Um, we had a three-toed sloth recently. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, there are some mammals. Awesome. Um, yeah, so we have another question here from, I guess a suggestion here from, from uh, Jim Roper again. If, if collecting data for a longer time, can you have the data collecting be interactive, such as uh, watching the data accumulate? It can advise the potential observers to choose certain times of day from being neglected. So every day as an observer wants to watch, they can see the time that would be the best watch. That way you won't have a bunch of people all watching uh, while they eat lunch. Maybe we can spread the love around a little bit and have more, more time covered. And that's a great question. Um, oh my gosh, I, it's really cool to hear your, your all's thoughts about this because you're mirroring a lot of the thoughts we had and the conversations we had in developing the best way to collect data live. And we talked about that and we completely agree. It would be really cool if we would be able to have a way for you as a participant coming to collect data to see how many other people are watching at the same time as you and to kind of have a graph that's showing over time what's the most frequently watched time so that we could spread our effort out. And currently right now, with the way that we have our tool set up and the way that we are recording that data on the back end, we don't have that availability right off the bat to be this interactive um, type of um, with the data tool itself. But maybe what we could do in the future is, as we're collecting that data live, maybe communicate back out to you all in the community what times are being more frequently watched so you can understand the times that need a lot of love and the times that seem to be pretty well covered. So maybe that's something we consider going forward is even though the tool, we can't really modify that at this moment um, to do that functionality, maybe in the future we can have that. And then in the meantime, we could maybe have more of a communication between us and you in terms of what the data is looking at as it's coming in. Thank you. Great point, Rachel. Yeah, we're always looking to build on the tools that we have. Um, so we're getting to about 4.55 now. So I'll wrap up with three more questions if we have time. Um, I think this is a good one. Uh, please tell me the most surprising and oh wait, let's start with with this one that just came in from from Jim again. Have you analyzed when people watch, um, like when people are actually watching the camera? I'd like to see that graph. Jim, I love that you asked that, and I definitely can make that graph for this data and put it into our um, put it into a post or blog post for this. So stay tuned. I can do that for this. We haven't I haven't put together those actually time watched graphs for the Panama Live. I've been putting those together for the hawk happenings, which if any of you were a part of that investigation, data exploration is coming soon. And so I think we should definitely have those graphs available for us to peruse both us as scientists and um, the larger community, because it kind of gives us a window into what that sampling effort of all of us was um, to give us an idea of how well our coverage was and seeing what's going on. Because some hours of the day, we had the whole hour watched by at least one person. But then other hours of the day, on um, some days of the week, there was maybe one person watching for a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours in the afternoon, there were some gaps in there, which is okay if you're watching over a longer period of time. But kind of like you point out, like over two weeks, it would be useful to know how much we watched. Awesome. Um, okay, here's sort of a, a couple good wrap up questions for us. Uh, Hillary Hunt wants to know, what was the most surprising and interesting things you discovered about these birds as a result of the data collection? I think that's a great question. And I'm gonna share a graph because I did see some of you wanting some more data in the chat. So let me share my screen really quick. Let's see. And I wanna say before I show some more data um, that what I'm gonna show you and what I think is really interesting is the variation between the species. Like, we know that species are different, but it's just really cool to see how and what things are different. So right now you're seeing a gray-headed chakalaka graph, and I'm about to populate this graph with the morning, midday, and evening bars. And this is looking at how the percent chance of arrival changes 
and five minute interval since the food is put out. So zero again is the time that food is put out. And in the morning, for the great head of Chakalaka, it looks like the percent chance is pretty low. It doesn't rise above 18%. It's about 8% right when food is there. It doesn't, it's not there. And then again, it comes back. Midday, we have this pattern where it's actually higher towards the beginning of one's food put out, and then it decreases over time, which is more of what I ex would expect from all of these species. And then evening, we see the same pattern, which is really cool. We see still this higher percent chance of arrival at the beginning, and then it decreases. And like one of you pointed out earlier, there are other species. So this is the gray-headed chakalaka. This is the gray cow wood rail. So there's this kind of difference. And I think what you pointed out that some of the species may either be avoiding each other or waiting for the other species to go to the feeder first as a cue. All that could be going on, which is really cool. And I think that's what this exploratory phase of this visualization helps us get at is like, what could be going on? And we can then move to the next step of maybe testing some of those ideas and talking about them and hoping to inform the next investigation. All right. Um, so one last question. People are, I saw some questions in the chat about how people can get involved with the project and if we have any projects upcoming, like if they're, what's coming up next down the pipe. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and throw some links to both this data exploration um, uh, web or the BirdCams Lab website where you can explore for yourself these, these graphs that Rachel's been uh, showing during the webinar and also share a link um, to where you can sign up for um, alerts on when new projects are happening. Um, but if either of you have any last words to send off about that, I will leave you to it. Sure. I'm going to share this screen and I'll let Renee put in a word here edgewise as well at the end. But this is our thank you because we really want to say thank you to all of you. Burkham's Lab, Panama Live, this is all possible because you are interested in the birds. And so we get the privilege as scientists to work with you to discover more about these birds on cam, come up with new things about these birds that we come to love. And so like Ben said, he's going to put those things in the chat. And if you didn't get your question answered or you want to know more and you can't figure out how to sign up or anything like that, you can always email us at birdcams at cornell.edu and you can follow us for updates on BirdCams Lab. And with that, I'll let Renee say anything, last words that she'd like to. Thank you so much for watching and participating, everyone. And again, if um, your, your questions don't have to stop here, there will be more exploration um, and maybe even more data collection, but certainly keep the questions and ideas pouring in um, because we are the resource for that. So I saw some questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, please do email us, um, check out our Twitter, and uh, we're pretty quick at responding to questions in both of those places. So thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your night, and we hope to see you again on BirdCam's lab or any of our other investigations. Have thanks, a great guys. night. Bye. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.